Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Uh, we're delighted to have you uh, join us today. Uh, we've got a great uh, speaker. Um, before we get started, just uh, really uh, hope that you all will engage with us uh, during this presentation. As always, there's the chat box to the right of the screen and encourage you to utilize that, especially at the end of our um, presentation during uh, Q&A, uh, when you can uh, utilize that to uh, address uh, questions that are relevant uh, to this subject matter today. Delighted to have Dr. Mike Chupp with us here today. As uh, many of you all know, he is on the uh, uh, executive leadership team at CMDA and uh, have wanted to have him on here for a long time. Um, Mike um, just uh, is an incredible guy. Uh, I did just want to start off in the very beginning. Just a, a week and a half ago, Mike lost his um, his uh, father-in-law um, to a very long battle um, with an illness, um, uh, Dr. Wayne Butts, uh, who uh, had an amazing legacy as a uh, doctorate of education and was an incredible influence on many people, including Mike. In fact, I want you to appreciate Mike's tie today. Um, <laughs> Dr. Wayne Butts was a lover of uh, exotic and beautiful ties, and he left his his uh, uh, his ties to Mike yeah, and one of yeah. those that Mike has uh, donned today. So uh, just a little bit about uh, Dr. Chupp. He graduated uh, as an AOA scholar. Um, with a uh, medical degree uh, at Indiana University in 1988. And then he completed a five-year uh, residency in general surgery at Methodist Hospital in 1993. Um, he is a uh, long-term member of the surgical department of the uh, Southwestern Medical Clinic uh, and Lakeland Regional uh, Health System in St. Joseph, Michigan. Um, from there, um, Mike uh, left and went to Africa to Tinwick Hospital and in August of 2016, he completed 20 years of service there as a, a career missionary with World Gospel Mission, uh, serving at Tinwick Mission Hospital in Kenya. If you've ever been there, it's just an incredible institution. And now, as I said, Mike currently serves uh, with the executive leadership team at CMDA in Bristol. Um, and Mike is going to be presenting today, um, uh, operating outside your surgical uh training comfort zone. I, I was teasing Mike, I'm an internist, and I'm hoping he's going to teach me to be a, a surgeon today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike. Well, thank you, Lance. I'm so grateful. Appreciate you uh, pointing out the tie and honor of my late uh, dad in love, as I called him, Wayne. And uh, I've told the staff here I'm wearing a tie every day to come to work, even though that's not our dress code in honor of my late father-in-law, Wayne. Uh, it is a great privilege uh, to be invited by uh, Samaritan's Purse World Medical Mission to come and be a part of this international uh, health forum, uh, this webinar. And uh, this will be a first for me. And they've been walking me by the hand, uh, the staff, wonderful staff at Samaritan's Purse. So thank you. I uh, This topic that I've chosen today, um, Lance, is because I am a poster professional for someone um, who likes the th things to stay the way they are. And uh, my brother, youngest brother, is a professor at Purdue University, and he teaches a class called Organizational Development. And he spends an entire semester uh, talking to students about how to get people over their resistance to change. And uh, the funny thing is, God led me on a path to become a medical missionary and change is, is just a part of life. And this morning, as I was meditating and ask, asking God to help me share about what it's like to be a career medical missionary or involved in any kind of medical missions, I got to thinking life as a career medical missionary is a little bit like always being a chief resident in whatever specialty that you enter because you're, you're responsible like we are, those of us in medicine as a chief resident in our training, you're responsible for people, but you know there's so much more to learn. And so you wanna just suck up information and training from everyone that you meet mm -hmm. so that you can keep increasing your capabilities. And so this talk is about uh, pretending. Now, the other similarity is I think my income as a missionary may have been slightly less than when I was a chief resident. Uh, and so th there are some other similarities, but the learning curve, I chose, uh, this title slide, and I, I don't know, uh, folks, whether or not uh, we've got the, the, the title up there, if I'm going to have a chance to, to see those um, coming up on my screen. There you go. I chose this particular graphic um, because you see that curve of that stick figure uh, going up that curve. You know, they say people talk about a steep learning curve. Honestly, 
the learning curve in medical missions, especially for those doing procedures, I never found it to be steep because that would intimate that it's over with quickly on the x-axis. But honestly, it's a slope up that's gradual and continues to go up and up and up the learning curve. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. Could I have the next slide? So uh, my medical missions career took me down two unexpected paths at Tim McMission Hospital in Kenya during a two decade career that you see there 96 to 2016. And one was actually having a specialty that I had no background in uh, take over my career in Kenya. And the other was discovering leadership and management gifts uh, that were un completely untapped until life as a missionary uh, physician in Kenya provided the right environment uh, for them to actually fully develop. Could I have the next slide? So I have three basic learning objectives uh, for all of you out there uh, this afternoon, if you're in the Eastern time zone, and that is describe obstacles for referral in the developing world, because that's really why we end up having to make decisions about treating people uh, doing things that we may not have been trained to do, uh, present WHO guidelines for safe surgery in developing world, which were established in 2009, and then to discuss how to prepare for unfamiliar surgical cases. I'll take the next slide. So in this regard, my inspiration is Dr. Ernie Sturey, whom I met as a medical student from IU in 1988. And Ernie, until his last testimony, in front of 300 medical missionaries at Brackenhurst when he said, I just want you to all to remember, God is so faithful. And two months later, he passed away. And with only a one-year internship in the Canal Zone, Ernie learned on the job how to do almost anything that patients needed over the course of 35 years. And yet he, he did this with a caveat that he shared with me early on when I was a resident visiting. He cautioned me, Mike, these patients are God's special creation. Don't ever experiment on them and don't ever take their lives for granted. Uh, and that really stuck with me my whole career as I thought about doing new things that I, that I didn't feel like I had a whole lot of experience doing next. So um, Karen Salmason says, the best things in life are often waiting for you at the exit ramp of your comfort zone. And this, I chose this picture because my first month here in Bristol, I was taken to an island on Lake Holston and I jumped from a similar height and I can't stand heights and I was scared to death. And uh, so I, I grabbed this picture. Was, I was, I'm a whole lot fatter than this guy jumping. So this is someone else. But uh, we well, you know when you hit, sometimes there's bruises and it, you don't land the way you, you hope to land. So sometimes in medical missions, you do feel like you're taking a leap. And it doesn't always go perfectly. Next. Well, I've come across two contrasting attitudes over my 20 years with medical missionaries that I worked with um, at Tenwick, uh, either long-termers or short-termers. And on the one hand, which is more and more pervasive, I'm Mike, I'm just not trained to do that. And examples, of course, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but I only do joints. Can't you just let me do joint replacements? That's useful. Uh, or Okay, I may be an internist like Lance Plyler, but I, I don't do oncology or AIDS or dermatology or whatever. So uh, just let me do general medicine. That's all I can, that's what I'm going to do. Or I'm an ER nurse. I just don't do OR nursing, OR nursing, or I haven't done that procedure. I had a cardiac surgeon say, Mike, I'm a cardiac surgeon. I haven't done an appendectomy since my residency. Are you really kidding me? I'm supposed to do an appendectomy. Um, and so that's on the one hand, but then there are some who maybe are, it's worse, a little more dangerous. Whatever comes to the door, that's my mandate. Uh, my patient care world is the skin and its contents. And by the way, those specialists in Nairobi for me, but other capital cities in the developing world, they have no clue what they're doing. And so I'm the best chance these patients have. Why would I ever refer? Or, you know, Mike, by just testing out this new procedure today, uh, even though I've had a complication or two and it took me six hours, it's really going to benefit future patients if just because this one suffered doesn't mean the future. Next slide. Well, my stretching got started early on in my career. And the picture up there on the left was me as a medical student assisting Dr. Roland Stevens at Tenwick, uh, helping to do a thyroidectomy. Uh, and boy, that was a stretch. Uh, never first assisted as a medical student in the U.S. Uh, and then at 
also got to do endoscopy, uh, to do some bronchoscopy, all as a medical student. And so these, this was exhilarating uh, to get stretched. And it was just an indication that if I was going to come back and do this as a career, I was going to have to be willing to adapt and new, do new things. And I actually, as a college student, uh, Dr. Plyler did a, an amputation uh, under the guidance of a, a missionary doctor in, in uh, Kamakui Hospital. So uh, even from college, was learning to get stretched into surgery. And Dr. Weshi, uh, who was at Tembeck for 30 plus years, told me my first month there, Mike, I've been here 30 years and there's no week that passes that I don't see something I have never seen before. So getting used to doing new things and seeing new things is just part of cross-cultural work in the developing world. So next, what I expected to do as I went to Kenya, uh, I did not expect to do bones or brain. I expected to do the GI tract. And even after general surgery training, I was comfortable with abdominal surgery, all kinds, including removing ascaris, uh, from kids' uh, GI tract. Next. And yes, uh, ruptured appendix. Early on in my career at Temec, I was so delighted. I felt so good about doing an open appendectomy on a perfed appendix and right in my comfort zone. Next. But then quickly, of course, faced non-comfort zone cases like this gentleman uh, whose right leg weighed 75 pounds. And he had elephantiasis. And he had been told in two other hospitals, you need a below knee or above knee amputation. And he came to Temek looking for another opinion. And if you'll look in the picture, his left leg, he was born with polio. So his left leg didn't work at all. And this man was an educated school teacher. He didn't want to lose the one leg that gave him a base to touch the ground, but it was dragging. He couldn't get around. And God, just by his own kindness, had uh, caused me to hear a testimony at my very first Brackenhurst conference, an Ethiopian plastic surgeon uh, who was talking about how to treat patients with elephantiasis, that you don't need to do amputations, but you basically, as you see there in the pictures on the right, that like peeling an artichoke, you peel off all those abnormal pathologic soft tissues and underlying the muscle and fascia is good tissue. And so we did a skin graft. Uh, I was so glad that I was encouraged in this way to save this man's leg. And then the next picture you'll see in the, in the follow-up uh, next. The next picture is the, the slide of him in the clinic in which the graft is mostly taken. And he's very happy. His name is Moses. He was able to go back to his classroom and use his walking stick much more easily. And uh, it, it was a blessing. But this was a stretch. I uh, had three people pick up a leg, the leg to put it on the OR table. Um, but afterwards, the exhilaration of trying something new and knowing that God was on my side to, to have me cross paths with an experienced plastic surgeon was a, was a great encouragement early on in my career. Next slide. Or this Maasai warrior that I saw around midnight one night at Tenwick on the receiving end of a cattle raid, the Kipsigis people were waiting for them and, and uh, shot him with an arrow right through his right eye. And this looks bad enough. The orange paint was lead-based paint. Um, and if you go to the next slide, that was bad enough. But if you'll just take a look, that lateral x-ray, if ever I almost peed in my pants as a surgeon, it was looking at that <laughs> lateral x-ray, uh, for sure thought maybe it, it was around his spinal cord, but the AP showed that the tip of the arrow was right behind his mandible. So, I mean, you're never going to see in any, the longest surgical training program in the United States. So next slide, you're, you're never going to be trained how to take care of this. Um, the, the arrow passed right through uh, his right globe, his eye globe, and was right behind the mandible. And so just a little bit of MacGyver action here. Uh, I'm sure the Bard Foley catheter company never envisioned their catheter passing through an eye and through the right side of the face like this, but uh, put it on the shaft of the arrow and pull the Foley catheter through his right eye, through his right face, and then and then pulled the catheter back through and did irrigation so I didn't have to fillet open his face to wash out this dirty arrow tract. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, I'd like to say that this is something I carefully thought through, but it just sort of happened and, and came together. And uh, next picture, he recovered fairly well. He did need eventually an artificial eye for that right eye socket. And the really neat thing, of course, what motivates us uh, in the church to get involved in medical missions is to is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And John, this Maasai man, um, 
he heard from our chaplains the truth of God's love for him. And Bible says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than to let your whole body be thrown into hell. And John uh, found eternal life, even though he lost his right eye. Um, and that's the arrow that we removed there. So we're we're delighted, uh, not that uh, that we figured out and we we behave like a MacGyver, but that to the gospel of Jesus transformed another life through our ministry. Next slide. So on the path of doing surgery, I, I went on a detour and I said, my life is kind of a, I'm a poster professional for change. And that detour was into orthopedic surgery. And every third uh, bed at, at Timbuk Hospital, when I got there was were patients with fresh fractures, bone infections, or complications of bone treatment at other hospitals. So next slide, I discovered a new surgical passion and, uh, and found out that I really enjoyed fixing fractures and helping people walk again or children with their supracondyl fractures being able within six to eight weeks using their arm again without it being crooked. Next slide. So I went from a, a, a uh, focus on the GI tract and bowel to bones and uh, ended up treating thousands of fractures over 20 years at Tenwick and uh, really loved it. I found that I was more visual of a surgeon than I thought I was. Uh, in general surgery, we don't generally get to inspect our work because it's usually in the abdomen or somewhere else. But uh, here you get to inspect your work by x-rays and patients, young people, uh, whether they have spine surgery or knee surgery can walk again. It's really rewarding. Next slide. And uh, even cervical spine surgery, um, we had a lot of patients uh, who would come in uh, with uh, C4, C5 fracture dislocations. And that was very scary for this general surgeon uh, to tackle. But I had help from visiting neurosurgeons like Dr. Burt Parks, who showed me how to do it and gave me the instruments. And it was remarkably like uh, accessing the carotid artery, only you just pull the carotid out of the way and there was the anterior cervical spine. Uh, and then next slide, toward the end of my career, I would have never guessed it, uh, that I'd actually be teaching orthopedic residents um, how to do less invasive techniques of fixing fractures like femur fractures. And our president of CMDA, Al Weir, uh, in February shared with us, with us that if God showed us in advance all that he had planned for us, we might be excited, but some of us, including yours truly, might just go into hiding because we wouldn't believe what was coming. Well, next slide. I had a great partner and gifted surgeon who was, who's probably the most courageous surgeon I've ever worked with, Dr. Russ White, who, by the way, had his own knee surgery yesterday uh, to, uh, for a partial knee replacement, and I hear he's doing okay, uh, had only a year of non-cardiac thoracic training in England. And uh, he made a huge impact for about 14, 15 years that we were together on esophageal cancer in Africa, but he kept seeing a great need for heart surgery because it wasn't being offered and children were dying, adults were dying with rheumatic heart disease and he was willing to be stretched. And now if you'll forgive the pun, he's on the cusp, a good cardiac term of launching the first mission hospital with the help of Samaritan's Purse and Franklin Graham, uh, a cardiac hospital and cardiac surgery training program in East Africa. So I, I was blessed to have this iron sharpening me throughout my career. Next slide. And I was just with Dr. Jim Brown in West Africa this year, amazing surgeon who's the program director of the PAX program. Jim has learned to do an amazing array of different kinds of surgery. I took a picture of here of him doing a scope on the brain, a ventriculoscopy on a child that had hydrocephalus and opening up the third ventricle on this child. And so I just, I'm just in awe of what God has done with some of his servants and stretching them to be able to meet needs and then setting that example for PAX residents. So um, next slide. I wanted to quickly go into uh, what's in the literature. Uh, this article from earlier this year in World Journal of Surgery, are American surgical residents prepared for humanitarian deployment? And the answer is, wow, the comfort zone is getting smaller and smaller. And their conclusion when comparing the logbooks of American surgical residents versus Doctors Without Borders logbooks is there's a huge difference. And the biggest difference, OBGYN, 47% of cases in the Doctors Without Borders logbooks, 0.1% in the U.S. experience. 
for a general surgery resident. Orthopedics, 21% of cases in Doctors Without Borders, 1.9% in a U.S. general surgery resident log. So their recommendation, we need, uh, recommendation was we need new mechanisms uh, for getting relevant surgical skills if we're going to better prepare uh, our surgeons in America to be global surgeons, if you will. Next slide. But as we're talking about increasing access, the Lancet Commission says 2 billion people do not have access to surgery they need. We have to, we have to couple that with the World Health Organization saying, but you need to be doing safe surgery. It saves lives. Next slide. And so they came up with some guidelines that I just wanted to quickly go through. And these are basic uh, for all of you involved in doing procedures. These are just clear, obvious things, yet they make a difference. And if we pay attention to basics, even as we're adding new procedures and doing new things, if we will take care of these 10 things, then we'll have a much higher chance of succeeding in doing new stuff. Correct patient, correct site. I can't tell you the number of times I'd walk into a room, the staff had already given spinal for a partial hip replacement, and they had the patient on the wrong side because the elderly patient who was confused said that it was on the left side, but really it was a right femoral neck fracture. So make absolutely sure that this basic correct patient, correct sites uh, attended to avoid anesthesia complications. Most critical task, getting a trained professional anesthesia provider to be present throughout the case. Prep for airway management. And this includes being ready to get control of the airway even during a spinal or regional block. And remember that a difficult airway that you should think about uh, an awake intubation or switching to, switching to regional anesthesia if it looks, if your anesthetist determines it could be tough. Uh, prep for high blood loss. If, if you're gonna do a risky procedure, have a adequate blood bank ready, basic. It, especially if it's elective procedure and you don't have blood, another, uh, you should refer the patient. Uh, know the patient's allergies. Minimize risk of soft site uh, uh, surgical site infection uh, through antibiotics. No retained objects. At Tenwick, we went through some tough times. Dr. White and I did because we were passing sponges one at a time and we lose track. We learned that you pass sponges in fives and tens, and then you can have much more accurate sponge counts. Um, secure and accurate specimens, effective team communication, and then routine surveillance of surgical capacity, volume, and results. All of these, who said, are very critical to safe surgery. I'll take the next slide. Well, what stops us from being able to refer patients to more trained specialists who are in bigger institutions. Well, finances, they in many mission hospitals, current bills must be paid and a deposit ready for the next level of care. And this could be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for a patient and their family. Um, they have fear. Uh, it could be possibly tribal fear. In other hospitals in another region of the country, their fear that they'll be ignored or abused. Um, often it's just the unknown of a bigger city, the capital that the family may never have been to and trying to navigate the medical system seems daunting. Lack of familiarity here. It's, uh, this refers to us as missionaries or our national staff, even who don't really know what's available out there. And we assume that specialty care in a particular discipline isn't available when we really haven't checked and we're in a bubble, um, and we don't have adequate knowledge that sometimes stops us from referring. Lack of options. Truly, there may not be options. If you're in Niger and Galmi Hospital, there truly may not be options for referral for advanced neurosurgery. Transport is difficult and costly. It may not be uh, available. And then there's just time. Sometimes our patients need, it, need intervention quickly, and there's not time to get them to even the specialists who are available. So this elephant shows you a temporary obstacle. Next slide. Um, and in Kenya this year, the flooding took out the road, main road from Tenwick to Nairobi. And this is a little bit more of a long-term obstacle of actually getting patients to the capital for care by specialist. Next slide. In the big picture, if we're looking at the, in the long haul, the long term, um, this, this author pointed out that our long-term goals are to develop surgical specialization. And while as a general surgeon and as the PACS program, the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, we wanna train broadly, uh, broadly experienced surgical residents to do all kinds of specialties. In the long run, 
Africans want to see development and surgical specialization. So let us never stop progress in this area. Uh, and this author, uh, Fernandez Cruz, pointed out, in the context of surgeons working anywhere with clear limitations in infrastructure or non-urban areas, it's a, this specialization should be promoted to provide the best care to patients. And at Tenwick and other places, we've seen orthopedic residencies spring up, um, talking about having OBGYN residencies spring up, and not just thinking that it's only generalists who should be promoted. Next slide. So if you're being, if you're contemplating as uh, someone involved in global surgery or cross-cultural developing world medicine in any specialty, internal medicine, OBGYN, you name the specialty. Uh, if you are considering extending to do something that you've never done before, or that in your conscience, you know, this is going to be a stretch. God's going to have to show up. I'm going to have to do a lot of preparation. I have this little mnemonic to help us remember what are some factors we need to think about. First of all, have we been transparent with the patient and family? And I had a great role model I mentioned earlier, Dr. Bob Weshi. Even in cases which he had done many times in his career, he still explained his patients, his lack of a specialty training in the given area, and his willingness to refer to the capital or another hospital if the patient or family desired to do that. And so he was very open with them. 95 out of 100 times when I observed, families appreciated his reputation, his honesty. He's a Christian in a mission hospital. They chose him as opposed to going to another place where there might be a more trained specialist. So let's be transparent and transparent with other doctors. Uh, if you're a, a short-termer in a hospital with long-termers, be open about what you have and haven't done, and then work together to make a decision, a wise decision on whether or not you should be doing this procedure or this treatment. So the R is risk versus benefit. I was just in Cameroon in February. I've done a number of cervical spine fusions, uh, but I had a patient that had a terrible arthritic C-spine that was a chronic problem, and there was no neurosurgeon. And they said, Mike, we know you've done this. Why don't you go ahead and do it? And honestly, I had to tell the family, I felt the risk in this patient who was neurologically intact was, was too great uh, for me to attempt this complicated uh, C4-5 uh, fusion uh, on this patient. And so we went to the trouble to find someone in the capital for him to go to because I felt that the risk was too high. Um, an emergency is an emergency and no other options. Seems like a no-brainer. Um, there are sometimes subacute emergencies where timing, uh, you have to make a judgment call, but you got to be prepared for emergencies ethically. And then accountable to oversight and review. M&M conferences, I think, are very important wherever you're going. Uh, and if there is no M&M, at least accountable to the medical director or to some other physician about outcomes for things that you're trying that are new. And then finally, T, are you thorough in your preparation? Next slide. How do you prepare for new things that are going to stretch you? Well, clearly, it's like, again, being a chief resident. You remember being a chief, uh, if you ever were a chief, that you spent a lot of time reading and preparing uh, so that you could do well. And these days, we have so many more, so much more access uh, to technical resources. And even when I was in Cameroon, in rural Cameroon, I watched YouTube videos on a particular instrument set and how to use that to do a cervical spine fusion. So far more than when I was a chief resident, but read at least two technical resources, watch videos and prepare. And along the way in your reading, you may realize this is, I am way over my head. We cannot do this in this setting. And then you tell the patient and you see what's, what else you can do. Email. Uh, at, at CMDA, and even when I was in Kenya, I knew the resource MD second or the numeral two opinion at gmail.com. It's recently been handed over to Mrs. Jill Johnson and uh, Susan Carter, who's our director of uh, Center for uh, Medical Missions, uh, says that Jill has over 400 specialists in this network that you can um, access opinions and help and obviously pictures are important. If it's a dermatology or an x-ray abnormality, send those pictures. And then assess. Be prepared as you can. 
uh, for emergencies in terms of blood typing and crossing capability and resuscitation protocols and uh, equipment, assess um, whether or not uh, your instrument sets are working. If you're doing this under fluoroscopy, uh, is your fluoroscopy working? Talk to your OR nurses and find out, uh, open up instrument sets. I would do this routinely, even after a lot of experience at Tenmuk. The day before, I would open my instrument sets. I would make sure the right plate was in the set that was probably going to be useful. <clears throat> make sure everything was there so I didn't get surprised uh, when we got uh, to the case. Um, assess your anesthesia capabilities. Um, assess anything that might be involved in accomplishing this particular procedure as you get stretched. And then P, clearly praying for discernment, asking God for to protect the patient, uh, for equipment function, for excellent teamwork. And please don't shortchange the importance of praying. You ask God to intervene, and then when things go, go well, you can give glory to God uh, who was there with you and helped you and often will inspire you during difficult parts of procedures or treatments, and he gets the glory. If you don't pray and ask God and things turn out well, there's a temptation to take credit uh, and for our egos uh, to grow. So you reap what you sow. So REAP here is the other acronym, read, email, assess, and pray. Take the next slide. Some other pearls or safeguards I wanted to share with you. Uh, first of all, if you're gonna do a big case, especially uh, a case that's gonna require a lot of energy and focus, don't do new things at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Start a case that's new to you early, especially if it's a long one. And I think that's giving the the, the most you can of yourself to the patient. Uh, two, get a good first assistant, someone uh, who isn't going to stress you out because they're not paying attention. They have no clue um, how to best help you. And so you're already stretching yourself doing something that's not as familiar as the 500th laparoscopic cholecystectomy that you've done or 500th hysterectomy. Doing something new, get someone who's going to pay attention and, and help you in that regard. Uh, other pearl is to sign off with the long-termers. There may be some pearl, some help, some idea that they share with you that can make all the difference in the world. And they may even be willing, because you're stretching yourself, to let you have the best anesthetist who's available on that particular day, to let you have the best x-ray machine, because they want you to be successful for their long-term patients, especially if you're a short-termer. Or they may say, wow, that Whipple pancreatectomy in that room at that time with our blood supply, you should not try a Whipple pancreatectomy here at such and such mission hospital. And that's just wisdom, I believe. And then last, competent anesthesia help. Make sure that you're gonna have good help because you got other things you gotta be concerned about, not worrying about the airway. Um, and so even if that means bringing in another missionary doctor who can do anesthesia, so your focus is on doing a good operation or a procedure or providing whatever exchange transfusion, whatever the procedure is that you are going to do your best. Next, I found some excellent uh, surgical resources for me uh, and others have repeated this. I think these books, and I believe that they're available in PDF, they're not as attractive in PDF form, but I found that the green book, the green book was like my uh, Missionary Surgical Bible, if you will, uh, by Maurice King and Peter Buse. And especially in places where you do not have advanced instruments or operating capabilities, King and Buse have produced a volume here, especially for trauma, that is so useful. The back cover is actually what kind of fractures can be are amenable to, to traction and which are not. Uh, it's so important they put it on the back cover of their book, their primer. Uh, and I found that useful, especially early on in my career before I had developed more capability to do invasive uh, open reduction internal fixations. Primary Surgery Volume 2 is a non-trauma edition. 
lots of really good hints for doing all kinds of surgery. And the chapter on osteomyelitis, chronic osteomyelitis, very, very helpful. And I put there free downloads are available. Uh, next slide. Because I ended up doing uh, a, almost a solid 10 to 12 years of orthopedic surgery at Tenwick as a general surgeon, uh, my favorites to help me, first of all, figure out what should be done was Rockwood and Green's two volumes for fractures in adults and a single volume Rockwood and Wilkins fractures in children, this colorful edition. Uh, these books look beautiful. And the great thing, uh, Dr. Plyler, about new editions is they make a slightly older edition um, a little bit antiquated for our US friends. Right. And so they're willing to donate to us their old books, which for an atlas of surgery, basically just never gets outdated. And maybe it'll be black and white, like the other book there, Hoppenfeld and DeBoer, uh, Surgical Exposures and Orthopedics, the best gift that any surgeon gave me in 1996 as I was going out the door of my hospital in Michigan was an old brown, black and white version of this. And I lived with this book and I took umpteen dozens of pictures of myself at Tenwick in our old orthopedic operating room with this book open next to me at the OR table so I could understand the anatomy, how to get to the femur or the radius or the proximal humerus, you name it. So on the left, the books on what you're supposed to do when you get there. The book on the right is how to get there. And I found for a general surgeon that I could make this happen if I prepared well in advance. And the same is true for all the surgical specialties. There will be books just like this uh, that, will, that will help you if you have the time to prepare. Take the next slide. And I, I just wanna finish up by sharing with you a verse uh, from 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And uh, my summary of this verse is all for one and one for all. All for one and one for all. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So God takes all, all of those things and gives them to one, to you, what a privilege. And then you can take all those things and abound in all. And of course, the point here Paul's making is he's talking about spiritual things. But I think also in service for the king, we're trying to help the poor in the developing world as we do cross-cultural international health. That I believe um, that as his grace abounds in us, all kinds of technical things were capable. I mean, you think in the Old Testament, God enabled his spirit, enabled technicians to build the temple, to build Solomon's temple. And by God's spirit, they did that. Uh, he enhanced their technical capabilities. And God's spirit will, in my experience, has done that for me. And I believe he will do the same for you as you're getting stretched um, in, in doing cross-cultural uh, service. I, 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 I realize I finished just a couple minutes earlier than I'd planned. Um, and I just want to, in terms of a pearl for emailing consultants, something I left out, and since I have a couple minutes, I found, you know, you get used to working with colleagues and colleagues who come and work with you short term and especially neurosurgery, plastic surgery, you name the specialty. If they have a chance to come and work with you and see what you're up against, those are the most valuable consultants I found over the years to reach out to and ask for their advice because they know the nuances. If you re reach out to a specialist who's never done cross-cultural service, uh, there's a tendency for them to want you to do high-powered things that just often aren't possible in a setting like a Tenwick Mission Hospital or, or a more rural place like a Galmi Hospital or wherever you're, wherever you're working. So e reaching out to those who know what you're up against. And then the other principle is, I found, is to email two of them. And I would choose, for example, in neurosurgery, I had a couple of contacts to help me, whether it was spine injury or brain pathology, uh, infections of the spine. I would reach out to a colleague that I knew was fairly conservative. And I would reach out to a colleague that generally was very aggressive. And if both of those colleagues would respond and say, wow, 
this is really important for you to intervene aggressively. Then I knew, wow, then I probably should intervene aggressively. If on the other hand, my aggressive colleague said the usual aggressive thing, but my conservative colleague who'd been in my situation said, you know, I would just treat that with antibiotics or I would do this least invasive technique of fixing that. I tended to pay attention to that uh, and to be a little bit less aggressive. So having that balance in as you reach out to consultants, as you're being stretched, um, I, I think was very helpful to me over the years. Here's another little caveat is that I've told the residents uh, at Tenwick in orthopedics and general surgery, let us never be guilty of being more aggressive or trying more cutting edge treatments than are done in the West. Uh, that doesn't make any sense that we would be pushing the envelope more than what the West does. And believe it or not, occasionally we would try to do things and we would try to be surgical when the when the right treatment of 2017 or 18 was antibiotics. So why would we do that? Uh, especially we have the same antibiotics and it's oranges to oranges. So uh, Dr. Plyler, I've finished even still a little bit early, but I'd be happy to address any uh, questions that might uh, come up. Um, I do see here uh, one question that's come up on the uh, on the chat. Yeah. Um, so before actually before we uh, get started with the Q uh, and A there, um, uh, just want to say a phenomenal presentation, Mike. Uh, that was uh, encouraging to me. Um, I might even try some surgery sometime. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Don't worry. <laughs> you you um, wear a, you wear a tie too much, Doctor Plyler. Yeah. You're like yeah. me now. Yeah, but um, no, I just want to ask our audience if they would uh, just to encourage them uh, if they don't object, just to type in their name and their location, just to give us a good idea of um, who is uh, you know uh, joining us and uh, and just who we can reach out to. Encourage you uh, uh, also, listening audience, just to invite more and more of your uh, colleagues, um, as we really want this to be a tremendous uh, uh, support uh, for Samaritan's Purse and other organizations, but. Um, uh, back to our presentation, Mike, that was uh, phenomenal. I can say, just being out on the field so many times, I've been with surgeons, Mike, many, many times. I can think of one in particular where we were down in Ecuador and uh, a gentleman had a very complex um, ankle fracture and it was a relatively young, inexperienced orthopedic surgeon. He picked up the phone and called a good friend of ours and uh, who is an ankle specialist and just, you know, talked him right through it and wow. did a phenomenal job. So that's just, uh, you know, one example. But um, uh, it, it, the other thing I'll just uh, add is uh, in my phone, I have thousands and thousands of doctors and, and nurses names and, and their contact information. So you're right, Mike, um, all the time, you know, I'm thinking uh, in my work, uh, maybe it's not necessarily related to surgery, but all the time I need a subspecialty you know uh, their uh, their expertise uh, in and whatever so it's good to have those uh, right right next to you and you can access them all over the world so um i'm getting behind on questions here mike so i'm going to get started so uh, alan alan sawyer asked a very good question he says could you discuss who 2009 safe surgery airway management guidelines so that we can all get that right on the quiz <laughs> yeah, so I've got the quiz in front of me, um, and and so good question, uh, Alan, my my good friend Alan, whom we were together in February in Cameroon. Uh, so there are a lot of principles. I, I don't have the time to go through all of them, but I would say download those safe surgery guidelines, 2009. I did that; it was a piece of cake, and there are ten basic principles that I had uh, on the on the slide, and there's a whole page of highly recommended differentiate with strongly recommended versus just uh, a standard recommendation. And uh, so difficult airways, uh, awake intubation uh, does, um, uh, it is a very strong recommendation uh, by the safe surgery guidelines. An awake intubation should be considered for anyone that's assessed to have a difficult airway. So if you and your anesthesia provider say, this is a tough one, whether it's an obese patient with a short fat neck, uh, consider under local anesthesia, an awake intubation. Um, basic things like checking for breath sounds, uh, as well as whether or not you have the tube uh, in the esophagus for gastric ventilation. Yes, that is highly recommended. Um, 
Anesthesia providers should definitely uh, maintain their airway management skills and have familiarity in dealing with difficult airways. Um, and in general, uh, pulse oximetry is always a good idea in monitoring uh, patients, especially intubated patients. As I said, there's a long whole page of highly recommended um, recommendations, high, high recommendations in that PDF under the uh, topic guideline, general guideline area of anesthesia provision. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that I hope that helped Alan know which which answer is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I think we we should be able to figure it out from there. So um, thank you, uh, um, Dr. Thiessen, um, one of our post residents, general surgeon, says, "Do you have any advice for balancing your abilities to complete a procedure with limited resources for post operative care?" Yeah, uh, Dr. Thiessen's asked a great question. Um, the place where it was most remar stood out to me and what he's getting out for post-op care would be in our neonatal unit. And we had multiple times where we could successfully pull off operating on a three or four pound baby, maybe, maybe a larger baby with a tracheoesophageal fistula. We would technically perform a good procedure. Anesthesia would do a good job. And then the baby would die 48 hours later um, because of bad, peri bad inadequate post-op care in our nursery. And so it is, it is critical for you to assess your track record. Talk to the other doctors at the hospital uh, providing care. What is the track record for care? And honestly, sometimes we at Temuk have assigned a resident for the first 12, 24 hours to remain, to do, to do shifts, to be with our patients, to make absolutely sure that a cardiac case that's been done on pa bypass, that we have the right people in recovery uh, to take care of the patient. Because if routinely patients are dying in your recovery room, uh, then that's a factor, uh, yes, Dr. Thies, that you need to, to weigh in on whether you can do safe surgery. Um, even if it's difficult for the patient, even if it takes them a day or two to get to the capital city, even if they have to spend two weeks or a month raising the funds to see a specialist in the capital city, if you have a 95% mortality rate after a particular procedure, um, it's better, it's just to be honest with the family and see if they can get the resources to go to a place where post-op care can be adequate. Good question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Josh. Um, Eric Kramer states, uh, often I'm doing uh, internal medicine and emergency uh, uh, medicine by myself looking for experts to help. Um, you mentioned the email address, but is there a forum or a Facebook page for mission docs to help each other with tough cases? Wow. Well, again, my world is surgical, um, and I know that the the PAX uh, the, that the PAX folks, the PAX organization, has a forum, uh, especially for their alumni, to discuss tough cases. So, if there are surgeons or sur surgical subspecialists out there who would like to get involved in that forum where they talk about tough cases among the expats and among the national grads, uh, then get a hold of uh, Keir Thielander of PAX and uh, he can give you the details on how you could get on, on that mailing list and be a part of that forum. In terms of Facebook, I, I am, I'm not aware. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Eric, I, I really don't know about a forum, but the MD second opinion, certainly uh, I'm told there are 400 specialists in, in that network. Yeah. And uh, Eric, you can always uh, reach out to us as we have access to uh, thousands of doctors too that uh, we mm -hmm. could potentially put you in uh, contact with uh, as does CMDA. So um, thank you. Um, Heather Fowler, uh, thoughts on training primary care doctors in certain surgical procedures such as uh, family practitioners doing C-sections, small rural hospital needs. Uh, this, she's coming to us from Pennsylvania. So uh, thank you, Ashley, for asking that question. I, I think it's an important one, and I really hope that this would have some bearing uh, also on primary care doctors um, to help out. So I think uh, let no one come away from this presentation thinking that I'm saying that, uh, that uh, you can go out go to Africa or Asia and be a missionary and you don't need training. If training is available, by all means, then go for it. And 
I know that in family medicine, there are actually some fellowships out there. I know that Via Christi, an uh, old friend of mine, Dr. Todd Stevens is the program director uh, for the Via Christi, Christi International Health Fellowship for Family Docs. And they have rotations specifically for that in that fellowship to go to mission hospitals and uh, coupled with some rotations in the States and overseas to learn how to do C-sections and basic surgery. Um, the other option I've seen done many times over the years is to um, cooperate with and agree with a small to medium-sized mission hospital where there are not a lot of surgeons or the PAX hospitals are difficult because the focus is on training nationals. So in this regard of getting family docs trained, smaller mission hospitals, you can write to and, and agree with a, a surgeon or an OB or a highly experienced family doc who's in a smaller mission hospital. Uh, and of course, there needs to be some understanding up front, Dr. Plyler, on what this entails and that the moment you show up, Ashley, that they don't leave and go on vacation for three months, but that the intention is that you'll be trained uh, on how to do C-sections and basic surgery. Mm -hmm. I've seen that happen in places like Copsoir Mission Hospital, which do they don't have surgical residents and primary care doctors um, can go and learn these basic surgical skills. Um, so I think there's some options. I, I would recommend, like uh, Dr. Plyler has mentioned, many connections with many hospitals around the globe that would be willing to have the, uh, we'll, you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours and come and provide care and help mm -hmm. to the staff and get the training that you need. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, Alan Sawyer has one additional point. He says, when special uh, surgeons uh, go to serve at mission hospitals, teach your skills to the long-term missionaries or the PAX residents who are there so that that skill can be transferred. Oh, good. Yeah, Lance, yeah. That's, that's a really good point. And, Great point. And, it, and it, thanks, Alan. You reminded me of one other thing I'd hope to share, that um, you, the long-term people, uh, long people have lots of plates that they're spinning. And I found myself often trying to triage the decision. Um, Alan, I'm sure has seen this because he's been all over the place where the long term is like, hmm, do I work on this administrative challenge that I haven't been able to get to today because Alan is here? Or do I go scrub with Alan and learn how to do this complex GYN procedure? And it's really tempting to say, Alan, God bless you. You're the right guy. Go ahead. I'll see you at the end of the day because I got these projects. So my challenge to those who are end up being long-term or who just happen to be watching this webinar who are long-term is that it is, it is important that we bless our, our visitors who come into our specialists, that we be willing always to be a chief resident and a learner and to not miss out and waste opportunities for learning from the Alan Sawyers who are with us that can teach us new techniques. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think uh, unequivocally, uh, that's one of the benefits of, um, you know, guys like Alan Sawyer who visit our, our partnership mission hospitals is that they bring their subset, especially expertise, uh, and can share that skill with uh, the long term uh, missionaries. So very good yeah. point. So uh, I believe, uh, Dr. Chupp, that is all the questions we have right now. Um, one thing I I did uh, forget to do in the very beginning, I actually we always open up in prayer. And, uh, I don't you're know. Gonna, I got, you're gonna reap what you sow. I you're know, gonna reap what you sow. I know. I got so excited about uh, you speaking today that I failed to pray. So uh, if I could, I don't want to break that habit. So I'm going to um, close in prayer, but then make a, a few uh, comments. But uh, if we will bow our heads. Mm. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you so much uh, that Dr. Uh, Chubb could be here today and. Lord, I just lift up his family and his wife, Pam, uh, over the loss of her father. And just uh, thank you again for an amazing uh, Christian legacy that he has left. And um, just uh, just uh, encourage Mike and his family. Thank you for him being here today. And I thank you for this listening audience, Lord, that you would just bless them. That, uh, Lord, somehow that this webinar could really uh, inspire them uh, just to become involved and uh, use their medical skills. Uh, around the globe uh, to glorify yourself. And uh, we just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, uh, Mike, thanks again. That was phenomenal. I just want to make a few closing comments. want to remind everybody that CME is available for this session. 
Um, so that's a great opportunity. Um, we have been working extremely diligently to make the CME available on the recordings. I've been told that that I'm hoping that'll happen next month. We've been we've been promising that for several years, but it really is. It's right around the corner, uh, and it's going to become a reality. We're working on CEU for nurses too. Um, so we're working on a lot of things with this webinar. We really we're getting close to a thousand people, and we really want it to grow and just. Uh, not just for the sake of growth, but really uh, for sake of uh, ministry's sake. Um, really, I'd love for it to be a, a, a meeting place where it can be more than just a webinar, but uh, kind of maybe what um, uh, Eric Kramer was just alluding to, maybe it's a place where we can uh, converge and, uh, you know, um, really feed off of each other's expertise and, uh, and it just be a place of engagement and encouragement. So, uh, help me uh, grow the uh, International Health Forum. Uh, just also want to say um, that if you're not on our mailing list, you can uh, join the forum at health.samaritansfirst.org uh, Samaritans um, and uh, learn about the upcoming events. Our next webinar will be Wednesday, July 11th with Dr. Andy Norman, uh, who will present from VVF uh, vesicovaginal fistula to preventing maternal morbidity and mortality. So hope to see you then. Thank you for joining us here at the forum.